think we're going to go ahead and uh, get into lab yeah, two then at this point. Yep. So uh, this is where things get a little bit interesting uh, as far as what we want to, what Mike and I have kind of dubbed chain reaction. So keying off this atomic theme. Uh, what if, you know, rarely does a technique occur in isolation. So uh, obviously what we did there was a very basic test, but how would we actually chain some of these attacks together? Uh, to then make sure we've got coverage for a sequence of events that might happen in our environment. So let's take a look at this example of a chain reaction. And just a little bit of background on this. Um, there's a lot of other frameworks out there that people are using for testing and we encourage you to use uh, whatever works best for you. Uh, we're, we're doing something that gives you a lot of flexibility we think here. So I, we used the analogy before Mike and I were talking about Lego. So we'll give you the basic building blocks Put them together however you want, uh, and hopefully Mike and I have some, some ideas on things that will sort of emerge later on. But that's really the, the genesis of this idea is to say, here's the small basic test. You can chain them together. Obviously, we're using batch files. You could do PowerShell scripts. You could leverage other frameworks that you might want to use to run these test cases. So uh, it's really your information to do the testing with. So uh, hopefully that's helpful. We think um, you can combine these in some really creative ways. So let's take a look at what I've got here on the screen. So now we're going to take the RedServe32 payload and we'll emulate some very, very basic attacker activity. So an attacker gains ex execution on your environment. They run RedServe32, which we saw in lab one. The next question is, well, what do they do now? So um, a couple of different things that could happen at this point. Uh, and Mike and I have coined the phrase alternate endings. But the first ending that we would say maybe or the next phase of this test would be the attacker enumerates a bunch of different things in your environment. So they're going to run things like uh, enumeration of domain accounts, local administrators, shares, uh, processes that are running, network connections. And so what you see on line 16 is actually a flattened version of this file that we've got created on the Atomic Red Team called discovery.bat. So I just took discovery.bat and flattened it into a single chain of uh, commands using the and sign. There's a couple different ways to do this, but this is a very simple way to say run this, then this, then this, then this. So the first test, RedServe32, the second chain, the attacker is going to run a, a long sequence of uh, discovery commands. And then the next chain of attack would be line 21, where we actually can schedule a task, for example, and then run uh, something at a different time. So it's very common for attackers, and if you look back at even the life cycle or the, the flow that MITRE has presented, uh, there's, there's a sequence of these tactics, right? So they gain execution, then the attacker does like privilege escalation or persistence. We're trying to just keep it very basic so you get the idea of where we're headed with the atomic testing. So the flow of this attack would be we have RedServe32, runs some enumeration, runs a scheduled task, and then just for safety and make sure we don't leave anything on a test system, let's go ahead and clean up what we've executed on our, our scheduled task. So this, is, this will be fun because I think Mike will show you in a minute what this looks like in like an EDR technique, but we'll, we'll go ahead and just uh, talk about two other things, then we'll execute the test. So alternate endings, these are, these are things you can do. So if you want to take it a different way, like another way for an attacker to actually run this command would be to get execution via RedServe32, and then maybe they do a PowerShell downloader and execute uh, discovery.bat in its entirety. Okay, and then they call discovery.bat. So that might be something that happens. Uh, another alternate ending, you might actually run a scheduled task, we've definitely seen attackers do this, that then call RedServe32 to some other URL with a payload. Etc. So you can see here we're just popping a command prompt, but you could also put whatever payload in that scheduled task you wanted. So there's some different things that this is going to light up quite a bit for uh, different products that are monitoring the system. You have net cons, you have registry reads, you have uh, persistence with the scheduled task. So again, as far as the actual execution of the, the very basic test, um, we can just run the lab. We can see a bunch of different things happening on the system. And we can then go look in our logs and confirm that all this different activity actually is categoried or, or cataloged rather, sorry. So uh, while that's happening, I'll just go ahead and bring this up uh, and just kind of refresh here and just confirm that everything we're seeing is uh, being 
The nice part about chaining these is it it's beyond even Syslon, right? We're able to, because you're querying the domain, you're querying different groups and whatnot. Um, these will generate other event logs. So now you have the capabilities to confirm your detection with you know Windows event logs and anything that's hitting domain controllers and whatnot. Uh, it's, it's really awesome. Yep. So it looks like everything ran. Scheduled task was created. Scheduled task was then subsequently removed. That, that second phase may not actually happen. Uh, again, so wh while we're showing Sysmon collection, really the, the aim of these tests is to be really uh, something that's vendor neutral. So something that would allow you to test different products that you may be evaluating or that you have in your network. So we really don't want these tests to be tied to a particular solution. So just realize Sysmon's great, it's free. It's a good way, way to get started. You may have more advanced capabilities. So uh, you, you can kind of get a feel now for how we're able to chain these different attacks together. So we have a red serve 32 chained with a discovery, chained with a persistence. So um, I think we're doing good as far as timing. I, th that's a little bit more advanced uh, sequence. I want to make sure I pause and answer any questions that may be coming in at this point for uh, lab two. So I'll go ahead and just make sure we're good on this. So what, what questions do you have, those of you that are attending on using this chaining technique? And something to, to remember on this is when you're chaining these, you can add as many of these as you want. I mean, you don't have to make it very, like just three of them like we just did here. I mean, you saw the alternate ending. The idea is to generate the event data, uh, the traffic and whatnot, and begin to go back and peel back the onion and see where uh, who detected it, which, you know, which products are being effective here. Um, goal is detection and prevention. You want to validate you have detection occurring across your full stack. And also, hopefully something along these, along the lines here, we had some type of prevention ha happening. Um, yep. Good or bad, right? That discovery bat file is really noisy. So hopefully someone, if you have a SOC monitoring, hopefully someone in that SOC is you know, ringing all the red bells that someone just profiled an endpoint in a network. <laughs> yep, yep, absolutely. Please so pass. we did actually, yeah, we actually did have a question come in, Mike. Let me just jump in real quick. Uh, we had a question come in uh, yeah, asking, ahead. is the chaining technique effective over the long term? And I would probably say, you know, depending on scale, not, you know, probably not, right? Like, as far as like, something that you want to maybe build in your models or maturity level would be different ways to automate different testing and, and automate the collection and things like that. So uh, again, we're just actually getting, you know, trying to get people started. Uh, batch files being the most simple way to do that, but um, hopefully that answers the question. Let's see. Uh, too much data. Oh, so the question came in, was there too much data to store across the full stack? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I, th that's really going to depend on the, the different organizations and what levels that you would collect. I guess maybe Mike could speak to maybe like your Sysmon config was a way to like pare down some of this or tune some of the logging you're getting. Uh, and if we don't need to get into that right now, that's fine. We could follow up with that. But maybe you could speak to that, Mike, just briefly. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's especially with Sysmon, right? You either collect everything or you filter out a lot of things and you collect specific, you know, tasks that you're executing. Um, in this Sysmon-like world, you may only want to just gather command, PowerShell, WMIC, net, the standard things that actors are using today. And that'll help you get to a degree of visibility of what's happening on endpoints. Um, probably the hardest part from there will be actually digging and reviewing all of that data and, and that's actually coming up here in lab three where we'll talk about measuring and seeing where you stand and how you progress over time. Um, you know, and then that's sort of where the EDR products come in, right? Whether you're shipping all of Sysmon with Windows event forwarding or you're putting it into some kind of log aggregation solution, um, confirming you have detection criteria is built into that as well. Um, it's going to take data. It's going to take a lot of information to store. So if you have an EDR tool and if it's collecting things and putting it all in one place, that could help save on that from not having to, you know, blow your Splunk license on 500 gigs a day of additional information. 